This is in response to a video made by Trustin JC, otherwise known as Laverne, in which he implores atheists to not dismiss the entire Bible on the basis that young earth creationism is such obvious nonsense. He's an interesting fellow, and there's a lot I agree with him about, and plenty I don't. He's given a hard time by theists and atheists alike. A lot of theists don't like the fact that he speaks out against young earth creationism and accepts the scientific findings regarding the age of the universe and most of evolution. He also speaks out against sola scriptura, the notion that the 66 books of the Protestant Bible are the sum total of God's word and that they cannot contain errors. Of course, I don't accept the idea that there is such a thing as God's word, on the basis that I haven't been convinced that there is a God. However, I agree with his conclusion that the canonization process, in which scripture was either accepted or rejected during the compilation of what we now know of as the Bible, was very much a human process. Where he and I part company, though, is that he maintains that it was Satan who guided those humans during that process and caused them to include false teachings. It's obvious to anyone who reads the Bible with their brain switched on that it does contain errors and contradictions. Laverne speaks about how the Apostle Paul, rather than meeting the spirit of Jesus on the road to Damascus, must have actually encountered Satan, who mixed some dangerous and false teachings in with a lot of the good stuff. He points out the fact that Paul taught a different salvation message from Jesus, Peter and James, one which will lead people down the wide path to hell rather than the narrow one to the kingdom of God. If Laverne is right, then most of us will end up in hell, including most Christians in America. Apparently God will not accept people who have sinned and continued to sin. Christians continue to argue among themselves about whether salvation requires faith alone or faith and works. Now I'd like to have a closer look at this thing called sin and see how it lines up with my own sense of morality. Unlike many theists, I don't defer morality to something or someone else. When I open my eyes and look around, I don't see a god or any evidence for one. If it weren't for religious people telling me there is one, I would have no idea. People argue a lot about morality and where it came from. I think it's really quite simple. Think of it in terms of pain and suffering. We don't like to experience pain or suffering ourselves, and only those who are demonstrably sick in the head actually like to inflict it on others. I'll admit that it gets a little more complicated if we take revenge and sadomasochism into account. However, it's nice to be nice, and if more people could appreciate that, we'd get along more amicably. So, I would equate sin with causing harm to others, whether directly or indirectly. That includes cruelty to animals and vandalism. But when we try to figure out what biblical sin is, it gets a lot more complicated. Sin seems to be anything at all which displeases the God character. According to scripture, God requires supplication and worship, all the time. And if we even think about worshipping anything or anyone else, we're in deep trouble. So when we hear stories in which God commands Joshua to commit genocide in the land of the Canaanites, we're supposed to accept that it's for the best, even if our innate sense of morality recoils from the idea of mass murder, especially if that includes children. I would argue that it's never okay to kill children, but, according to the story, and Laverne, those children were going to grow up to be evil, so the right thing to do was to kill them. In other videos he describes how, in the non-canonical Book of Enoch, angels came down and mated with women in the time between Adam and Noah, and that the offspring were giants, and that they had evil spirits or souls. The Book of Enoch is interesting and sheds light on puzzling lines such as there were giants in the earth in those days from Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. At the very least, the canonization process which led to the 66 book Bible is flawed. 
because the book of Jude refers to and quotes from the book of Enoch. So clearly, the author of Jude didn't consider the book of Enoch worthy of rejection. Having watched many of Laverne's videos, I'd say that he has a better understanding of what the ancient authors intended to convey than most other Christians I've spoken with. He has helped me to gain a better understanding of what, to me, is a fascinating and important subject. To his credit, he doesn't seem to be selling anything, unlike Ken Ham, Gregory Dickow, Joel Osteen, Eric Hovind, Ray Comfort, Peter Popoff, and so many others. He recognises what he calls wolves in sheep's clothing, and what I would simply call charlatans and opportunists. There's a lot of money to be made in the Jesus business. Occasionally, one of these dishonest preachers will have an attack of conscience and leave the ministry in search of a more honest way to make a living. If anyone hasn't heard of Marjo Gordner, I strongly recommend familiarising yourself with who he is, especially if you're a Christian who doesn't like the idea of being fleeced for your hard-earned cash. Here's a short clip from the 1972 documentary, Marjo. This afternoon that I'm going to relate to you is no different than any other afternoon except I had a visit from Jesus, praise the Lord. She put me up to sleep. I don't know how long I was asleep, but I remember I awoke. When I awoke, I was seeing a vision. I remember I looked up out of my little bed and I saw a mass of people. They were perishing. They were crying out for help. They were crying, somebody do something. Now remember, I'm only four years old. And I remember I sat up in my little bed and I looked up and I said, someone help all those people. Then a voice spoke back to me just as clear as though standing right alongside that bed. And that voice said, Marjo, you can help them. And I remember I looked down at myself and I thought, well, I'm just a little boy. I'm only four years old. What could I possibly do? What could I possibly say? And you know that voice spoke back to me and said, As I was with David, so will I be with you. I don't know how much came in. As far as I can guess, maybe about $3 million from the time I was 4 to 14. And I have no idea what happened to that money. I know that I never saw it or I never got any piece of it for my education or anything. And the Crusades, uh, you don't plan in the auditoriums. You don't make a lot of money from this, but it makes the personal contact. But the main money comes from uh, the magazines and from uh, the radio uh, program, you know. And But that's like a thing you've got to stay in it all the time. It's like the ones who are successful, they're just, they're businessmen who are constantly, they're like, you know, they're like Madison Avenue uh, PR men. <laughs> there are a lot of former clergy who lost their faith and whose conscience didn't let them continue to preach in a dishonest way. If anyone isn't familiar with the clergy project, I strongly recommend familiarising yourself with that, too. I'll put the links in the description. I would like to make it clear that unlike some of my fellow atheists, my end goal isn't to create more atheists. But I do want to reduce the number of religious fundamentalists. Many fundamentalists do become atheists, but I'd be happy if they simply accepted the conclusions of science for what they are and allowed reason and doubt into their minds. Laverne seems to be more consistent and reasonable than so many other proponents of supernatural creators. He actually seems to demonstrate the teachings of Jesus, in which worldly goods are eschewed in favour of devotion to a creator and preparation for the end of the world. He has a clear idea that we're 6,000 years into an 8,000 year time period, and that we're on the verge of major catastrophes. He's spoken a lot about end times prophecies and how they supposedly line up with current world events. I feel alarmed by this kind of talk because I'd hate to see this becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy where believers really do see a silver lining in mushroom clouds. I like to turn Pascal's wager on its head and ask believers, what if you're wrong and there is no God? You've been treating this planet as a temporary home for so long and spared little thought for what condition it will be in if your children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren are here 
unraptured, overcrowded, and trying to piece together a shattered civilization. Think about it. If you're watching this, Laverne, I think your heart is in the right place and that you're right about a lot of things. Given the fact that you believe that scripture can be and has been corrupted, can I suggest that you take a closer look at some of the Mosaic teachings? Why would a god want blood to be shed? Why did he require the butchering and barbecuing of blemish-free baby sheep and goats in those days? Why would God deny access to his temple to anyone who has had the misfortune of having been injured in the genitals? Could it be that morally questionable men allowed some of their own thoughts to contaminate the word of God, and attributed some of their own prejudices to the creator of the universe, if there is one? That's all from me for now. I will let Laverne have the last word. Many atheists say that they find contradictions in the Bible, and since the Bible is supposed to be the uh, true word of God, the inspired word of God, and that there can be no contradictions in it, many atheists say they reject the Bible on this point alone, that it's enough to reject God, Christianity, and the Bible because they do find contradictions in it. Well, the truth is, there are contradictions in it. And for those Christians who stand fast to the idea that there are no contradictions, well, the atheist is correct. You aren't using logic or reason. You are being intellectually dishonest. You are cherry-picking scripture and twisting other scripture to make it fit. For there's no doubt, no question, that there are contradictions in the Bible, and to deny it is to do a disservice to God. It's doing a disservice for His kingdom, for Yeshua. It's doing a disservice for all the prophets and apostles who died so that you could have the opportunity to hear the gospel and to reach out to God. You are doing him a disservice by making claims that are so easily discerned as being lies. 